Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week, we respond to and discuss a subject that you've requested, questions about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the Vision for Life podcast, and the basis for everything we discuss on this podcast is God's revelation of himself to us. God's revelation surrounds us. His revelation of himself brings wisdom and clarity to those who lack the ability to see. It provides us with a unique spiritual light, which allows us to see things that we couldn't previously, unaided by God's word and God's spirit. Today, we're asking how it is that God's word and his spirit change our understanding of and engagement in the topic of politics. I'm joined today by Hunter and by two members of Fellowship Denver, Blythe Scott and Jill Anschutz. Hi, Autumn. How's it going? Great. How's your fantasy football team doing right now? They're struggling today. That's what I hear. Yeah, it looks like only a 34% chance of winning. Well, we're up to 35. Great. Thanks for keeping up on that for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Today, Jill and Blythe, who are actually insiders to this whole topic of politics, they have jobs that give them a unique perspective on the processes involved, on the questions and topics at hand. So we've asked them to join us. Blythe, say say hello. This is Blythe. Hello, everybody. And Jill. Hi, Autumn. Nice to be with you. We're so glad that you guys are joining us today. We have a class going on, a Vision for Life class, under this topic as well, right now, politics. And Hunter is teaching that class. You'll see it available on our podcast feed as well. So Hunter, I'm going to ask you to start off our conversation with Blythe and Jill today. Lead us into what we'll be talking about and give us some context that links what we're talking about here in the podcast to what you're discussing in the class. Yeah, in the class, we are learning that politics is this broad category that actually describes a lot of different things that we do. And it includes things like what we call the public square, which is everything we do in common with other people, like go to work and go to school and start businesses and form homeowners associations. And fantasy football leagues are political. You have to decide on the rules and decide who's going to be the commissioner. In fact, one of my leagues... uh, ended this year because we couldn't get our political act together. But this podcast is going to be too long if I if I go further in that. There's also governmental politics, which is how we organize and we conduct government. And then that impacts the public square that we live in. Then there's electoral politics, which is how we vote for people who are going to be in the government. And that also includes the campaigning process that goes into that. And then there's what we might call persuasive politics, which is just all the ways we debate and discuss politics from the media to social media to advocating to volunteering in different ways to just arguing with your family about politics. That's all involved in persuasive politics. So the reason I'm really excited to have Blythe and Jill here today is because they get to see aspects of governmental politics from the inside. And that's a pretty unique perspective, as you've already hinted at, in that where most of us live is we have life in public and we vote. So we're involved in electoral politics as voters. And most of us are involved in debating or discussing politics. So we're involved in this persuasive politics. But many of us don't actually get to see governmental politics from the inside. And so I thought they have some unique perspective that could help all of us think through this as followers of Christ. Yeah, I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and introduce yourselves and explain how it is, what your positions are, how it is that you are involved in politics from the governmental aspect, what Hunter just mentioned. Yeah, so this is uh, Blythe. Again, I work for, I'm chief of staff for representative, state representative James Coleman. Um, He is um, a Democratic state representative. He is the House Majority co-whip. And so as his Chief of Staff, I am actively involved in helping um, write policy, research, um, uh, help develop bill ideas and uh, legislative ideas. Um, I get to see how he is able to really, um, having a leadership position in the state legislature, how he is able to really influence um, not only important policies, but also the culture um, of the state house in a, in a huge way. And I can talk more about that um, in a little bit, but um, it's been really cool to see how um, he's able, he's, he's a Christian, and how he's able to bring his faith 
to bear on how he interacts with um, others in the legislature on both sides of the aisle, how he's able to lead um, people in a culture of um, compassion and of empathy and, um, and, and pushing forward policies that truly um, lead to, to the flourishing of all people. And Blythe, how long have you been in this position as the chief of staff? About a year now. And explain to us what a majority co-whip does. He works with majorities. The Democrats are in majority in the state house, and he whips them. How? <laughs> Not physically, mm. though. I am pretty sure he's been tempted at points. <laughs> um, no, it's actually it's actually a really cool position. It's kind of a very behind the scenes, keeping people in line position, which um, traditionally means, hey, if hey, the Republicans are trying to call up this vote, make sure everyone get everyone on the floor to vote on this issue is definitely a traditional way that that plays out. Um, I have been really fortunate to see um, how Rep Coleman has used his position of authority to really lead his party and influence his party in this pretty divisive, tumultuous time. It's definitely still, he's not perfect. It's not a perfect um yeah, definitely, have, definitely have hard days. But he, I, he behind the scenes has played a really big part in um, helping people interact um, with kindness and civility with the other side. Um, if there are there have been there are situations where members of his party are being are out of line in some of what they say or do, or where they are trying to bring forward bills that even that are would be harmful um, to um, certain populations, and he very much influences um, uh, if those bills come to fruition or not, he's been able to redirect um, some some legislation that would not be the most um, fruitful for, for people. He's been able to, um, he, I've sat in rooms where he's led conversations between members of different parties and helped people reach agreement on, on some tough issues. So it's, mm -hmm. he very much behind the scenes, um, keeps people in line, encourages people, so kind of sets a culture and a standard in, in the Democratic state party, which is cool to see. A whip essentially gets his party organized, gets yes. the members of the House that are part of his party organized. If a vote mm -hmm. is coming up on a bill, mm -hmm. the whip is going to make sure that the votes are lined up in advance and and, and is working with people to, to see how they're going to, to vote. And, and mm -hmm. so it's kind of a coordinator position. Yep. Very and much, I don't yeah. know the history of the term, but I'm guessing they, they call it a whip because he kind of has to whip people yeah, into shape. De definitely. Yeah. And I like, yeah, definitely, definitely have seen moments where he's had to call up almost forcefully get back in here. Where are you? We have to vote on this. <laughs> hey, where we need to have this meeting. We have to don't figure maybe out get this the whip issue. Out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, yeah. I'm glad we clarified prior to our on air conversation for Hunter's sake, <laughs> uh, Blythe filled us in that the term co-whip does not have any etym etymological link to Miracle Whip. It does not. It Which does is not. the true and better mayonnaise. Yes. <laughs> so so we established that prior, but if, if you would like Blythe to help you understand it more as well. Tell that to my Mima. She's she's not having it. Yeah. Oh, no? She, she thinks... loves the Miracle Whip. To her, it is the only whip. Mm. So it genuinely, <laughs> in... in Mima's world is the true and better miracle whip. Perhaps you would even say the only. <laughs> That's right. All right. That's, That's right. Blythe. I have no um, comment on that. Yeah. Your, so Representative Coleman is a Christian mm -hmm. also. He, yes. he is a believer, mm -hmm. a follower of Jesus. And so that also is an aspect of your work that you share with mm -hmm. him, with your boss. Um, Jill, would you introduce yourself and let us know how it is that you're involved in politics. Sure. I'm the chair of a state board called the Charter School Institute, and we authorize um, just over 40 charter schools throughout the state. Most people, when they think of a public school, they think of a school that's within their geographic district. So you go to a Denver public school or an Aurora public school. And the purpose of our organization is to offer a more diverse set of school models that meet unique needs and wishes of families in terms of what the school day might look like or special needs that kids have or just a, um, a more independent model like a Montessori type school, which you typically wouldn't find in a public school system. How big is the board? That you chair? There are nine members on the board, and everyone is appointed by the governor or by the commissioner of education. Okay. And Jill, you were telling me the board is intentionally diverse ideologically. And so it has Republicans, it has Democrats, and it has independents on it. And each is appointed 
because they represent a specific party. So you were appointed as a Republican, Correct. but you have to work with folks that, that are Democrats and independents as well. Correct. It's in the state statute um, that creates the Charter School Institute that the board should have representation from all three official public um, or uh, political parties. And the idea is that that representation better reflects um, different perspectives across the state and that it's not just one political party that would control the direction that these schools go in. I want to mention, too, that we specifically asked the two of you to come, not only because you have this unique perspective and you are actively working in governmental politics in these ways, but you're also, both of you are part of Fellowship Denver, and both of you have been for quite some time. So we here today get to also have this conversation with you as a part of the same church family, which is which is really neat to be able to share your thoughts and ideas uh, with our church body. Can I just say a cool story that I did not say in our intro? And Jill, I don't even know if you remember this. I was connected to Jill when I first moved out here by a friend from DC, Chris Latondras, who um, was a mutual friend and met with you. It was wonderful. You connected me with Jeff Hannon, who um, I, and you know, I'm involved with a lot of stuff with Denver Institute, and he is actually how I got connected with my current boss. So maybe we owe it all to you. <laughs> it all comes back to fellowship, Denver. It all comes Denver. back to fellowship, yeah. <laughs> Hunter, in our questions that we're going to ask Blythe and Jill today, you have crafted those in light of what we're also talking about in the Vision for Life class. So why don't you go ahead and lead into, beyond introductions, our first question for them today. One of the things that we're talking about in our Vision for Life class is that government is ordained by God, and it exists to build a platform for peace, for order, and so that people in the world can flourish. That's what government is given the responsibility to do. And they're given the responsibility of doing that in a fallen world. So we see that, for example, in Genesis chapter 9, where Noah and his family are literally starting over in a fallen world after the flood. And God gives them the same cultural mandate that he gave to Adam and Eve. He tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. But on either side of that mandate, he also has to account for the fact that they live in a fallen world, and so he requires that justice be done. He says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood will be shed, for God made man in his own image. So within the fallen world, God has to set up government in order to defend and to protect the image of God in man. So from that, we we kind of derive this idea, government exists to build a, flat, a platform of peace and order and stability so that people can flourish even in a fallen world. You hear the same logic in Romans 13. Paul extends that to paying taxes. He says we should pay taxes to whom taxes are due. And taxes would support even more than what we might call criminal justice. They would have supported public services and public works as well. All, of, again, which builds a platform for people to, to flourish. So with that in mind, I just thought it'd be fun to hear how Jill and how Blythe connect what they do in government with building a platform for peace in a fallen world. So I might give this to Jill first, and, and Jill, explain how your work builds this platform and helps, helps schools, in your case, flourish. One of the things I think we often overlook is that a strong and functional democracy actually requires a very high level of literacy and education among the citizens. And we need people who can think and reason for themselves. And frankly, not all forms of government require that, but ours certainly does. And so part of the purpose, I think, of public education is to um, create a system that ultimately, um, at the end of, you know, 12 years of school, you've got people who are on the track to become productive members of society, people who understand their responsibility to others, people who are ready to work and to provide for themselves and contribute a portion of that to funding um, our, our government structures and the public services that you just talked about, um, and people who understand 
how our government is set up and why voting matters and how, you know, at a basic level, the justice system works. So these are all things that we expect um, a student who goes through the public school system would have in addition to their ability to read and, you know, do mathematics and things mm. like that. So I think that's an essential baseline level of um, understanding and education that we need the American public to have in order to preserve our way of living together. And you've really tied your work into the value of education. So what you guys do on this board is you you create the parameters in which school charter schools can be started, can be uh, can be what, what's the right word sanctioned mm -hmm. uh, you create the parameters which they could be started which they could be sanctioned which the quality of the education the students receive in those schools can be confirmed it's it's worth sanctioning you create the platform for people to then create educational opportunities for for students yeah exactly I mean I think part of the word public in public schools implies that the system is open to any student mm. that wants mm -hmm. to go to school there. And it sort of follows from that, that there must be an acceptable um, spot for each student in the system. And if you think about it, a system in which every school is exactly the same might be efficient and cost effective to run, but it doesn't at all account for the individualities of a student, the ways that, that different students learn, um, the emphasis on different types of like arts education or a specialty in STEM that might appeal to students with giftings and particular ways of learning. So our work is to make sure that there's a range of schools out there that meet the needs of different students, that those schools perform at an acceptable level academically, that they manage public funds well, that money is not mismanaged, mm -hmm. that teachers who work there are qualified and are held accountable, accountable to respecting students. And we look at discipline policies, we looked at safety policies, we look at facilities, and we make sure that across the board, there are a good range of options out there for families and students. Mm -hmm. And what you described before says, that the way that you view this as part of this question, creating a platform for flourishing, is that access to education for a varied and unique group of students is actually preparing them also to engage as future adults and in their current ways as children, but as future adults exactly. in society at large. Yeah, exactly. And Blythe, I'm really curious to hear how you see your work in the legislature creating a platform for public flourishing. I, I think it's often weird that people don't think that's what happens in, in, in the <laughs> legislature. And I'm sure you have stories you could tell that that's, not, ha that's <laughs> not happening. But it's also a pretty powerful vision of what good legislation does. It creates platforms that others can build upon in, in order to create good. So, so how do you see that playing out? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, and I, I always try to make clear, I am not a party Democrat or Republican. I, um, I've worked for both sides throughout my life and um, have seen really beautiful work being done on both sides um, uh, of our, you know, our, our political system and, the, and truly the ways in which um, we can promote God's vision of justice and peace and human flourishing through good laws and mm. good policies. And the reason I'm wor working for Rep. Coleman is because he, I mean, it's, it's very clear that is his heart and his, his desire. And I, I believe in him and what he's doing. And I want to be a part of furthering um, God's vision on this earth. And um, it's been really cool to see how I think one of the, one of the you know, government is not the answer. We know, we know Jesus is the answer, but government is definitely a tool um, good government, good policy is a tool that he has given us to further human flourishing and, and to further his purposes on this earth. And it's been really cool for me to see um, through my role this past year ways in which um, Rep. Coleman has done that through through certain bills he's helped get passed, um, through again, through ways that he has helped raise the standard in the politics in our state in such a divisive year. Um, but yeah, especially seeing how um, certain bills and legislation he has pushed forward that directly impacts some of the most vulnerable in our state, which 
um, is a biblical mandate. And um, a way that one of the ways we can do that is through government and through mm. through helping pass good policies. And and it's been cool in my position to see how I've been able to also directly influence that, which is again, even if you know not everyone feels called to actually work in politics or run for office, but there's a myriad of ways. Um, you know, you heard the way Jill's serving and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working for someone who's doing that, but I'm still able to directly influence a lot of his ideas and policies. And it's, it's really cool to, to see how we're able to advocate for God's purposes, um, in these roles. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm sure that nobody ever passes legislation or resolutions that, that don't, that don't lead to peace, order, and flourishing. I'm sure there's no mixed motives that ever enter the system. But, <laughs> but can you maybe tell us just just a couple, if if they did, a couple of examples of how other agendas besides peace, order, and flourishing would mm-hmm. would get into the system? Where do, how do you see that play now? I think it's important yeah. that we be aware <laughs> mm-hmm, of how mm-hmm. of how we do live in a fallen world, and it's important yeah. we be aware of how that plays out. Definitely. And again, this is why I am so passionate about seeing more Christ followers be political. And again, that does not mean you have to work for, you know, government office, but in some way be political because we need, we need followers of Christ bringing a high moral standard, a biblical standard, um, bringing Christ likeness into the sphere because as Hunter mentioned, there are Um, You know, I'm not going to give exact percentages or names, but there are a good number of people in this space who, you know, speaking from my perspective in the legislature, who are there for reasons different than my boss, (laughs) who um, are are motivated. I mean, all of us um, fall prey to to our sinful human nature, desire for power and fame and money and um, and and I I've I've seen that there are there Mm. are people, and especially in our current culture in our current system where money drives a lot of our politics, um, where people want power, they, they are, there are a good number of times where certain bills are brought forward based on special interests, based on powerful people of money. And there are a number of legislators who, who for, who want to advance either their career or who have different motives that are not motivated, like, like my bosses by a true desire to, to see all people flourish. And so it's so important that we have more people like Rep Coleman and like, like us, maybe some of you listening who, who have thought about being involved in different ways. It's, it's so crucial that we are. One of the things that I'm sure you see Blythe is that electoral politics does bleed into governmental politics, which is just another way of saying when, when the, when the legislature is in session and the representatives are there and they're, and they're, debating legislation and they're passing legislation, they also have an eye toward getting reelected. And so they're also asking, how is this going to play with the constituents at home? What point is this going to make on the political debate stage? What is this going to allow me to do down the road? They're asking those questions even as they're passing legislature uh, legislation. So, so just the question of peace and flourishing and order and good is not the only thing that's influencing right. what goes into passing yep. legislation. Yeah, and my uh, yeah, quick quick comment on that. I um, yeah, I mean the way our current system is set up is that people are running for election every few years, you know, and and that's a different conversation about how to how to change that. <laughs> um, but but we you know we we do see that, and even with and I, I'm confident um, you know Rep. Coleman is is open about, about all this. We we he just even had. He has a close group of um, advisors who he intentionally invites in to call him out and to keep him accountable for truly what God has called him to do. And just the other week, we had to sit down with him and 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 push him on on this. He is running for state senate. Um, so if you live in his district, uh, vote for him. <laughs> vote for him. Uh, but he uh, uh, and he there there were a few instances where where he, he was having trouble making some decisions that we shall, felt maybe should have been a little clearer. And he listened and with great humility and really helped redirect him and refocus him these next few months. And so I would say, who, you know, whatever side of the line, you, uh, you know, political spectrum you fall on or, or whoever is influencing you in your life, make sure they are humble leaders who will, who will listen to counsel and who are seeking counsel and who are being held accountable and um, who, who will take correction and, and encouragement. And that's, that's so rare for our leaders in politics and elsewhere to have that humility. And I think that's a sign that it's someone you can really trust is if they are willing to, to take correction and be humble and listen. So. Well, you're making an important point that is worth us being aware of, which is that all uh, political leaders, even those that 
that tend to have the, the very best of motives, all of them have to think about getting elected, and that inevitably sometimes shapes what they do. And, and, and sometimes politicians are doing things simply to make a point and, and a, to appeal to us or, mm. or as voters or to, uh, to stir us up as voters, and we should just be, we should just be aware of that. Mm, yep. I, I know we were talking beforehand, and something Blythe and I share in common is that when uh, we were younger, we <laughs> both wanted to be president. I think it was eighth grade for actually both it of us. We're, we grade, weren't yeah. in eighth grade the same year, just to be clear. <laughs> I was just a couple of years ahead of you. But, uh, but say eighth, eighth grade, grade for yeah. me and sixth grade for you. I, I wanted to be president. And, and in fact, my 14th birthday party was uh, a campaign rally where I gave a speech. <laughs> And uh, dropped balloons, and my mom played Hail to the Chief on my Sony jukebox. And I, I'm pretty sure that my motives weren't great. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Do either of you still have that aspiration? You know, Autumn. <laughs> Blythe, Blythe is not answering. <laughs> I would want to be a part of changing some very structural things about our political system before I would consider entering that myself. If drafted, (laughs) I will run, Autumn. If drafted, I will run. Okay. All right. Noting. This is now recorded. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll run Hunter's campaign. Maybe that's what I'll do. I was actually going to run in 2020. (laughs) That was what I wanted to do. (laughs) Oh, no, no. I was 2024 because you have to be at least 34. Yeah. Okay. I was 2024. So I, Yeah. I wasn't as about. So, so Blythe could have followed you. Yeah. You guys really right. missed the boat on this. We have a ticket. We have a ticket. Hey, it's not too late. <laughs> One word that we've used continually throughout our conversation so far is the word flourishing. Hunter, you wrote the question, tell us how your work in government helps to establish peace, order, and a platform for flourishing. So would you, H, would you define what you mean by flourishing? Because this is a word that gets used in this arena, within the political arena, for the good of human flourishing. Yeah, why do you ask such hard questions? I, I don't, I, it's a great question. I don't know that I have a, a cogent answer off the top of my head. Because we do throw around words like flourishing and the common good, and we assume that we know what that means, but sometimes we don't. So if I'm if I'm just drilling down on this off the top of my head, I think flourishing, first of all, affirms the the image of God in every human being. So it affirms the dignity and value of every life, and that life is worth protecting, and that life is worth preserving. And that's Genesis 9. That's what God is saying in a fallen world. So so I would go, flourishing starts with affirming the dignity and the value of every life. Once you affirm the dignity and the value of every human life, now you get into questions of life and livelihood. So questions of life are, how do we protect life? How do we preserve life? How do we give people a, a good chance to stay alive? in a fallen world. Questions of livelihood are now questions about how do we give people the opportunity to, say, make a living in a way that would allow them to provide for themselves and, and to be sustainable. That, that's a question that we should think through. That's a livelihood question. Uh, we, we start asking questions like, what is a basic standard of living that all people in our society should be able to have. Then we can drill down on how do you give them a chance to, to have that standard of living. When we're asking these questions, we, we can't solve for the fact that people are sinful and, and might not choose to take advantage of the opportunities that are, that are given them. And, and we can't provide total 100% safety. We, we all know that. And yet we would all agree, even if we, we would disagree on what the exact standards are and where the line should be drawn, we would all agree that because people are made in God's image, they, are, they have dignity, and that dignity should, dignity should be protected, and they should have a right to life and a right to live, and they should have an opportunity to create a livelihood for themselves. Hunter described how politics actually is nuanced in all of these different ways, governmental politics, electoral politics, persuasive politics. So we um, know that 
Unlike most of us, your work actually places you solidly in many of those political realms. And we discussed how that bleeds into this governmental politics aspect. And uh, your work also is shaped by what's being debated in the realm of persuasive politics. Jill, we, we touched on this before, but the board you chair is made up of Republicans and Democrats and independents and is purposefully set up that way. And so... My guess is that they have a lot of different perspectives on what charter schools should do or be allowed to do. And so how uh, does the partisan political debate impact your work? And how do you talk to and work with people who are on the other side of the aisle or have a different perspective than you do? When I first joined the Charter School Institute board, I was actually pleasantly surprised that the majority of the work does not bring up political divisions. But I think that's because charter schools on the whole can be a lightning rod issue among different political parties. But this board is brought together around the idea that if there's going to be charter schools, they should be high quality. So that is sort of a unifying idea among uh, people representing different political parties. That said, we definitely have political debates and our meetings are um, public meetings that are often attended by by members of the public. And so I feel a responsibility of being prepared to articulate why I might vote a certain way on a more controversial issue, because I know that it's not just happening, you know, in a boardroom. It's a meeting that's recorded and, and available for the public. So a few of the issues that we've recently um, seen some division around are whether a school can allow classroom teachers to carry guns. You can imagine that would be a political lightning <laughs> wow. rod. Um, and our most recent sort of heated debate was around whether we should incentivize schools to open in classroom instruction during the pandemic. And the that also was a, a discussion that sort of fell along party lines, sort of um, following the broader public debate around, you know, is wearing a mask a political statement? So in a lot of ways, we're a microcosm of that larger mm -hmm. political conversation. Um, and actually, one of the reasons that I, I wanted to um, sort of accept the invitation to become the chair is that I really felt a, a desire and a responsibility to keep that discussion productive and not just have it be, well, I think this and you think that and we can't come together around, you know, any kind of resolution. Um, because I think our ability to do our job well depends on being able to ultimately make some some difficult decisions. And sometimes we do actually have to go around the room and do what we call a voice vote, where each person says yay or nay on a particular topic. So it's clear who voted for for what. But ultimately, so far, we've been able to have what I would consider, you know, civil disagreements um, on, on most of the topics. And I think for me, the ability to do that, to have a discussion with someone who sees the same circumstances and comes to a very different decision of how they should vote, comes down to um, sort of the internal ability to say, I'm going to maintain respect for them. I'm going to to um, acknowledge that they're as intelligent that I, as I am. They're as well informed as I am. They have taken all the information available to them and come to the most reasonable decision that they can see based on the information at hand. And yet they've decided to vote differently than me. And I think maintaining that, which is sometimes difficult to do when you really, really disagree with someone, um, that to me is a foundational sort of internal discipline that's needed in order to be able to move forward across lines of difference. And that I think is becoming harder to do because we, the standard of that has really declined in the public square. Like if you're, you know, if you're watching, you know, um, talk shows on TV and commentary shows on TV, you're seeing, you know, um, both both the commentator and the guests that they have on the show attacking someone's character and, you know, saying that they just must be crazy to hold this 
this position. It's really hard to move forward when you're working with someone across a table if you allow yourself to go to that space and think. Mm -hmm. There's no logical reason that they believe what they believe. Hmm. Thanks, Jill. Um, Blythe, how would you answer the second part of that question that I just asked, Jill? How do you work with people who find themselves in a spot, who land in a spot different than you, who have a different perspective on a certain topic or issue? Hmm. Yeah, I think Jill articulated all that so well, but um, yeah, for me, it, it comes down to similar to what Jill said, um, assuming a posture of humility and only two things, I guess, assuming a posture of humility and always seeing the humanity in the other person. Um, and again, we have a broader culture, cultural, cultural and political context where that those two things just are not present really, <laughs> um, much anymore. Um, uh, and, and, and so that very much trickles down and influences all of us, even in our friendships and, and with our families and, and our workplaces. And um, and I, I, it's hard. I have I have people come to me, you know, who know my job or know what I'm passionate about, and and they're um, it's it's hard to maintain um, so often a level of kindness and humility in conversation. And so I I have really. Um, I, I love that Dave this morning preached, um, and a lot of what he said was um, a lot of kind of what God has really convicted me of the past couple of years. Philippians 2 is a passage that God has constantly brought to my mind as far as what, what should our posture be in these conversations. Um, if, if we're entering a conversation with someone who disagrees with us with the intention of um, proving a point to them or trying to convince them of our side, I do not believe that is the correct posture. Um, to enter a conversation. And that doesn't mean we're going to, I think like Dave said this morning, give up our convictions or be wishy-washy. We can still very much feel deep passion and conviction on, on issues that matter. We definitely should. Um, but I, God has really convicted my heart to enter every conversation with a posture of this person is right about something. And I have something to learn. <laughs> like I am 32. Like I have, I have a lot to learn. And as believers, we should always be growing in, in knowledge and wisdom and moving from glory to glory, you know, grow, growing more in, into who Christ has called us to be. And so I, I try to enter every conversation with this person is a, an image bearer of God, first of all, and they have something to teach me. So I'm just going to listen and I'm going to learn. Um, and I think of our pop, but I think of our posture is um, they're wrong and they're stupid, and I have to show them where they're wrong. Like that, those conversations I don't think ever go well. Rarely, if ever, go well. And so, um, really, it's about our heart posture, um, um, entering with a place of humility. You know, as Christ, did. I mean, he was the he was the only one who actually was was equal to God, and he he intentionally assumed a lower position and put others above himself. And so, so we are called to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I would just add, I, I've seen that modeled really well in, in my current boss and in this actual very divisive, nasty, often very nasty political climate where um, I've seen people literally come at him and attack him, both other legislators and um, constituents, lobbyists, whoever, and he just listens. He listens, and then he asks questions. Um, he doesn't yell back. He doesn't try to get, bring them to his side. He really listens, and I, I just think it's um, examining our heart before we enter conversations. What's my motive? Why am I even entering this conversation? Um, am I trying to show Christ? Am I trying to learn? I think all of those questions are really important to ask. What you're describing is very hard to do if someone comes comes yes. at you coming in hot, if they're yes. sort of on the attack already. I bet already. you get a lot of opportunities to practice. <laughs> the Lord sends you in the form of really annoying people. Is that is that true? Of, that's true of my experience as a pastor. Yeah. Uh, is that true of your experience working in working in the legislature? Yeah, and you know, and I will say, I think I think another hard aspect of our current moment is that the avail like social media and it's the 24 seven news cycle and the availability of information often makes people think that they are experts on something. Mm. Um, what did I was in a, heard it the other day called, um, ho hobby politicians or where, where basically it's like pe people. So yeah, I often will have people approach me really assuming they know more than I do mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or know more than like my boss does on an issue. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, that is difficult. Cause yeah, my, and I'm also one on the Enneagram. Cause you do sometimes so, <laughs> think like, I know more than you. Right, like, and sometimes right. you're right. Sometimes exactly. you do know more than that. You know, and, and that's, and that's kind of what, as I was praying, you know, thinking through this podcast, like the worst that can happen truly in a conversation like this is that 
I know I'm right, but I listen to someone anyway. Mm-hmm. That's good. And they feel heard. And that's very disarming. <laughs> like, so if someone does right. come into a conversation yeah. that way, then right. you not immediately becoming defensive right. allows you to potentially exactly. have a conversation. Yeah. And Blythe referenced yeah. uh, a sermon. So we're currently in a sermon series on First Corinthians and uh, learning about love. And not just the whole, not the whole book, just the 13th chapter. Just the 13th chapter. Thanks. That is very true. And learning about what it was that the Corinthians were not being. Yeah. And what Dave mentioned today is that an elevated view of self does not, does not allow you to extend the sort of self-sacrificial love uh, that Paul was <laughs> admonishing the Corinthians to, to do. They were not loving in that way. And mm-hmm. Paul was telling them that if if you continue to hold yourself in this elevated position, that you're you're not going mm-hmm. to be able to love in this way. And so mm-hmm. that's what you're referencing mm-hmm. and describing. Blythe yeah. is a response that doesn't mm-hmm. elevate yourself in the conversation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. One more question I'm really interested to explore with with you guys is this: as Christians, we have another political affiliation, and it is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God and the church are political realities. They are people learning to live together. We live under the authority of Jesus, the one we call the king. And then when the kingdom of God comes in full, God is literally going to rule the earth. Other other rules will be done away with. God is going to rule the earth, and his people are going to live under him, and they're going to live together on, on the earth. And we get to model that right now. Inside the body of Christ, we get to we get to express uh, the foretaste of that political reality. That's true theologically. What's often true experientially, though, is that what's going out and on out in the world politically washes back into the church and affects how we relate to each other inside the body of Christ. and And I know we've all got stories of of having political disagreements with people we call brothers and sisters in Christ. So I, I'm just curious to hear you guys reflect on how we can live together as followers of Jesus, even if we have disagreements on matters of public policy or voting or what we would just call worldly political issues, how we can still model this redeemed politics inside the body of, of Christ. So, Jill, do you have, you have thoughts on how, how you've learned to navigate that or are learning to navigate that? Yeah, I think— some of it for me comes down to the idea of um, rightly ordered desires. Like, where does my identity come from? And and at my core, in the most essential place, um, my identity is drawn from Christ, and that's not flexible. Like, whether I'm I'm in my you know, board context or my work context, or I'm at church on Sunday morning, like that is a true statement. And so any other alliances or associations or roles or preferences are secondary to that at best. And so for me, I think what that means in the context of the church is that um, there's flexibility for me on a lot of like whether you identify um, or vote Republican or Democrat or independent um, is not grounds for judging your identity in Christ. And so to me, there's a there's like a foundation there, a shared understanding that is actually missing sometimes in a broader public context. You don't, I don't share um, the same faith with the people who sit around the boardroom with me, but I do share that with people in this church community. And so I think it just leads to a different conversation. The challenges are still the same because the broader effects of the culture, I think I liked your phrase of sort of they wash back in and we have to still remember to um, sort of give people the benefit of the doubt. But there's a clarity about identity for me in the church that um, motivates me to want to understand but not necessarily judge or condemn where people fall on these sort of secondary or tertiary or other issues. So what Blythe was talking about just a minute ago, where we're learning to uh, think of ourselves as servants of all is especially important inside the body of Christ. Right. That's part of our identity as Christians is we are now servants of, of all. And Blythe, I know you've told me you've, 
you've had tense conversations with folks inside the church, and and in some sense that makes me really happy because I think we should be able to debate yeah. political things inside mm-hmm. the church and and do it in a way that's that's different. And another time, another. In other sense, I know that can be disorienting at mm. times, especially if we're pretty aggressive with each other. Like, how can you, as a Christian, believe in X or you know vote for X? Mm. So, how have you been learning to navigate those kinds of conversations? Yeah, I think um, yeah, a lot of what Jill said, I I, yeah, I would totally just second that. I um, you know, God has kept bringing to mind, you know, show grace as I've been shown grace, you know. Um, like, I think back to like, gosh, I get emotional. Things. I think back to like some comments and things I've said to people over the years that have just been so unkind and mm-hmm. un- unchristlike and um, out of like political loyalty or priority. And like, God has shown me grace and grown me over the years and got me to a place where like, I can, I can do the same for others, even if, even if we may disagree deeply. Um, and I, and I think that they are being harsh or unkind or, or whatever it may be, like I can, I have been there (laughs) and I might be there again. I mean, Lord forbid, but, but I, I can show grace, um, uh, as, as Christ has shown me grace. And, um, again, just being really intentional about adopting that Philippians two attitude of, um, of always putting the other above myself. Again, even if I know like objectively, like I'm right, like the knowledge I have is right. Hey, like they are still a, a person created in the image of God. They're my brother or sister. They do have something to teach me. Mm-hmm. You know, they do. Um, so let me let me sit here and, and listen and and learn and and create an environment and a posture um, where where they might be more willing to listen to me. Then, um, and I, I I just think that's so crucial and in, important, especially again in this culture where yeah, where we we've been told on both sides of the aisle. Um, and I think it was Michael Ware, someone. Someone from the AN campaign recently talked about these ethics buckets almost that both parties have created for us. It's like these are these should be your top three priorities mm-hmm. and anything outside of that is evil or not as important. And so often we in the church fall into that where we do. We say, oh, you know, Blythe's saying this. That means she must not care as much about this. So that's wrong. And I'm supposed to feel angry at her because that's kind of what the world's told mm-hmm. us. And that is so not right and not biblical. And um Justin Gibney from the end campaign, I think when maybe he coined the term, um, we, we should have a, um, moral imagination, you know, where we, um, we can take the good things from both parties and all sides of all sides of the aisle and all across the ideological spectrum. Like, like let's, we, as the church should be leading the way in showing the world a, a different way to engage in politics and, and a better way. Um, you know, like, like Jill was saying, like, even if I still at the end of the day disagree you know, with, with some of your ways you want to deal with these policy issues, like I can still love you and be kind to you and engage well with you. And maybe we can even come up with a new platform together Mm -hmm. on how to deal with these issues. Like we should have a moral imagination that's outside of these basically just two buckets our world is giving us today. Um, that, that ultimately points to Christ and points to the gospel. Um, and, and that shows how to engage with each other on, on a much higher standard than, than others have shown us. You started that by just reflecting on times that that you had been unkind to others or said mm-hmm. something offensive. And that, I'm really encouraged by that. That's a posture we should all mm-hmm. develop. And we can all, if we're honest, think of times that we've approached people in ways that have just not been loving. And, and as you were, as you were sharing that Jesus's words uh, in Matthew seven came to mind, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your mm-hmm. own eye. And he mm-hmm. tells us to take yeah. the log out of our own eye first. Mm-hmm. And, it's fascinating to think of that as a political act. One of the best political acts we can do in the body of Christ is to be self-reflective, humble, repentant, ask for forgiveness when we when we do things that are that are ungracious and unkind and and re, and re, confess and repent and 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 give each other grace. That that is politics, and and you're modeling that for us. So I really mm-hmm. appreciate the reflection you did there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In summary, our shared value in the gospel should be elevated above any other allegiance that we find ourselves considering, debating, thinking about, and engaging. Even though we should do all of those things, if we if we maintain them in proper order and allow Christ 
and our identity in Him, our shared value in the gospel, to maintain the highest position of priority, then the rest we can engage in and sort out and still love each other in it. Guys, thanks so much for joining us Thank you guys. today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This is a great time for me to remind you that Vision for Life is a ministry of Fellowship Denver that exists in two forms. One form is this podcast, and the second form is a series of seminars where we discuss difficult topics that pertain to where we live everyday life. And I'm telling you that because right now we are in the middle of a series on politics. And all I have to say is politics, and and you know why that is both difficult and why it's essential to where we are living right now. And so we're asking, how does the gospel of Jesus change and transform how we engage the political environment we're in? Those seminars are happening on Monday nights at 8 p.m. through October 12th. We would love for you to join us, and you can register for those at fellowshipdenver.org. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. This podcast is based on your questions and suggestions. To submit a question, you can send it in via email to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org or via text by texting podcast to 94000. Thanks to our guest, Hunter Beaumont, to Adam Englund for our theme music, and to our producer, Jesse Cowan.